Today we'll be discussing the career of comedian Gary Shandling, and we'll discuss hyperparathyroidism. This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic for medicine and health and grills me on that topic. Today, we'll be discussing the life and career of the legendary comedian, Gary Shandling. And we'll be discussing the disease that he passed away from, hyperparathyroidism. Yeah, and I came into this, I have to say, thinking, you know, my... Sister, my mother had thyroid issues, my wife, thyroid issues. I know a little something about this stuff. I actually know zero, as we'll discuss. This has nothing to do with hypothyroidism, which is another fault of the medical community, I'm going to say, to name. You could have named it something completely different since it basically is something completely different. Yeah, they're located in the same spot, but we'll get into that in a second. But why don't we start off with Mr. Gary Shandling. Let's do it, bud. I'm a huge fan of this guy. I teach in my stand-up comedy class. There always is some material about Gary Shandling. We also wanted to cover this because there is this Judd Apatow documentary, a four-hour documentary on HBO about Gary Shandling's life. came out in 2018, I think, so we're not ahead of the curve on this one, but it's something worth watching or revisiting if you haven't seen it in a while, definitely. Yeah, and the reason I want to talk about this is because you've mentioned Gary Shandling many, many times. If you watch this documentary, which is called The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling, which I watched in preparation for this episode, you'll see so many people consider him like the greatest modern comedian as a mentor to Judd Apatow, Sasha Baron Cohen, Conan O'Brien. He really went above and beyond for some of these people. And so... You know, Apatow says, Judd Apatow, who made the documentary, you know, he's this famous director, he's made 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, all those movies, and was a stand-up comedian originally. Apatow considers him to be the most influential comic to modern comedy. That's a quote from from Judd Apatow. Mm -hmm. And considers him his mentor, and nobody taught him to write or direct the way Larry Sanders. Like, basically, Judd Apatow would not be- The way Larry Sanders did. Yeah, did I say Larry Sanders? My God, clearly that's something I want to talk about, the way Gary Shandling did. Yeah, his influence, not just in you know people watching him and learning, but his direct influence on some certain people is not to be understated. So just a bit of background about Gary Shandling, and then I want to get into the reasons why you think he's so influential. So he was born in Chicago, raised in Tucson, Arizona, working class family. His mother ran a pet store. His father ran a print shop, and he had an older brother who died of cystic fibrosis. He was about three years or so older than, mm-hmm. than Gary In fact, that's why they moved to Arizona, hoping that the dry climate might be, right? So you, you, you start your young life sort of being devoted to this brother and moving, uprooting your life just so that this, this you know, older brother of yours or this kid of yours, in the case of parents, can be more comfortable. And it gets its time in the documentary for a a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, let's just get into that issue because it kind of permeates the whole documentary. Gary Shandling never talked a lot about his brother to many people, only those closest to him, like his cousins and things like that, knew about him even having a brother and his brother passing away. But I think it led him to make a lot of the decisions and the way he lived his life. Because when his brother passed away, I think his brother was around 13 when he passed away, Mm -hmm. his family did not let Gary have the closure. They did not really even tell him about it. He kind of just kind of heard his parents being upset in the house and they didn't let him go to the funeral and didn't. So he never had that closure to say goodbye to his brother. And of course, you know, now we know about modern grieving and things like that. This is a very important thing for children to experience. Man, we could almost do an episode about this because, you know, the mother's sentiment, as far as Gary was concerned, was something to the effect of, because he wrote this in his diary, uh, his mother said, I didn't want you to see mommy crying. 
which I'm pretty sure he saw mommy crying anyway, right? With the, the stress of having a son with cystic fibrosis. So when we're trying to protect children, there might be a selfishness there that in fact doesn't protect them long-term. Anyway, a huge discussion that can be had around that. But I think, yeah, as we're saying, it's, uh, what do you want to call it? Foundational part of his life, that whole experience. And so he was left to be like the main, obviously the only child now of his parents. I think there was a very unusual dynamic between him and his mother that they allude to in the documentary, just, you know, because he's now the only son and a, a lot of tension there. Anyway, he, you know, he went to study engineering in Arizona, but he left after three years and basically decided to go into comedy after that. And he had this seminal meeting with George Carlin. I don't know if you know this, this story, Ali. So he drove two hours from Tucson to wherever else Carlin was performing in Arizona. I think he was, I think he was, he drove from, you know, Arizona to Arizona, but still two hours, got in the car, went there and said, I wrote these jokes with you in mind, basically for you. And I wonder if you'd take a look at them. And George Carlin goes, yeah, come back tomorrow and I'll take a look at them. So he drives back two hours, the next day he drives back two hours, and then he shows up the next day. And, you know, in your mind, what you know about George Carlin, you might hear this story up to now, and you're like, let me guess, George Carlin wasn't there. That's or exactly let me guess, what I thought George was going to happen when I heard this story. George Carlin too busy just stringing him along, right? In fact, George Carlin had all of his jokes laid out, marked up, and he had said to Gary, I'm not going to use any of these jokes. You're green, meaning you're new, you're green behind the ears, but there is something funny on every single one of these pages. And most importantly, if you were thinking of pursuing this professionally, I would. I mean, that's enormous. This is George yes, yeah. Carlin in the 70s. This is huge. You just hear your hero say this. I mean, what else? You have no choice but to leave the engineering world and focus on writing. In, in this case, it was comedy writing more than anything. And I think that meeting was influential, A, because he went into comedy, but B, that interaction with a more experienced, legendary that time comic, making the time to mentor somebody younger, didn't have to, you know? That's the real measure of someone like George Carlin. He didn't have to do that, but he did. And I think that really resonated with Gary Shandling, and that's why he mentored so many people afterwards, which I didn't know about. To prepare for this, I watched the documentary, and I watched an episode of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Jerry Seinfeld. If you guys haven't seen that show on uh, Netflix now, it's basically Jerry Seinfeld getting together with usually other comedians and going for coffee with them in a fancy car. And then I watched the first episode of The Larry Sanders Show, but we'll get into that in a second. So you were saying, Ali, that after this, he kind of became a comedy writer? Yeah, not just any comedy writer either. I mean, Sanford and Son was a big deal at the time, and he wrote a spec script for that show. And uh, wh whoever the producer was like, uh, said, I don't think we've ever gotten a better spec script for this show than that. And then wrote for Welcome Back, Cotter, right? People, Some people might remember that show. That's John Travolta's start. I mean, huge, huge show. And uh, very interesting to hear that Gary Shandling was like, wait a minute, I can't even picture myself writing another three of these, never mind another 20 of these. We have this format, we have this formula, and we just keep writing around the same thing. And uh, one of the producers jokingly said to him, oh, look at you, 25 and already burned out. <laughs> but it wasn't a burnout, really. It was just like, I think he wanted to figure out who the real him was. He wanted to find his his own truth. And I don't think Gary Shandling was somebody who was going to find his truth kind of in the shadows as a writer, getting a writing credit, being in a room of others, collaborating, and sort of, you know, in the forgotten pages, the annals of history as a guy who once wrote for this show. I, I just don't think he found his truth, for, for lack of a better word. And there are two stories that kind of came out after that. One is he was writing for Three's Company as well, and he wrote some dialogue, and one of the producers said to him, well, I don't think that sounds like Chrissy. And, you know, Chrissy was one of the main characters, the, the bubbly blonde on the, on the show. Or one Suzanne of Summers. Suzanne yeah. Summers, yeah. There was three other bubbly blondes later on, but or two others. But he said he just locked, and he said, I don't think I could do this anymore. And he stopped right there and left, because he's like, I can't, can't do this. You know what? If you want to be a writer, let me just throw this out there. If you want to be a writer 
and you can relate to what just happened with Gary Shandling, you do not want to be a writer. Right. The it's, entire, it's you, you cannot be precious about anything. That, Chrissy wouldn't say that, is one of the most banal, easygoing criticisms of your writing you will ever get. Yeah. Mo you know, when I was writing, uh, one of the big things I would get, people would just be, they would hear my joke, and in the writing room, people would go, hard pass. <laughs> Like zero regard for my feelings. And that is what writing is. You're not, it's not about you personally. It's about your joke. Your joke doesn't work for us next. And you just keep going and keep going. And occasionally, occasionally you fight for your joke. But if you're the person who's always fighting for a joke, you're a nuisance in a writer's room. That's been my experience. So yeah, he was clearly not built for that. You just gave me an idea. I almost called you honey. <laughs> Man, we are well, spending I, a lot of time do, together on this I podcast. Love you. Terrific. We'll, we'll leave that in. Yes. Ali, we should do an episode on the writing room because you've been in a couple of writing rooms now. I'm couple, very yeah. curious about that. And we should do one about grief as well. Maybe we won't tie those two together, but I think those are two good, <laughs> good ideas. We should. We'll get a writer in here. We'll get a proper career writer Ooh, in here go. also to bolster up the limited knowledge that I have. There you go. So I was mentioning, you know, one of the things that made him leave these writers' room was the Three's Company episode. But the other one, he was in a serious car accident in 1977. He had a crushed spleen and he was in the hospital for two days in critical condition. Yeah, he was getting out of a car and he was hit by a car. Yeah, Just that's to right. Be clear, that's when right. People say car accident. I think people's mind all always go Good to, point. oh, yeah. Drinking and driving, enjoying the life, you know, all L.A., whatever you might think. I just wanted to add that nothing of the sort. Getting out of car hit by another car. Ali, in medicine, we call it motor vehicle collisions because, A, that encompasses what you just said, and B, mm -hmm. accident implies, oh, it's an accident. I, just, I spilled the milk at home. It's an accident, you know. This mm -hmm. often aren't accidents, and it's because of reckless driving, drinking and driving, things like that, carelessness. So, anyway, uh, another aside, but he had this near-death experience and essentially he heard a voice saying do you want to continue leading gary shandling's life and i guess this you know near-death experience with a light and all this stuff he said yes and then he came back to earth this isn't you know in his mind this is what happened and then he said i have to do something with my life i have to do something meaningful don't you low-key diminish gary shandling's experience with death asif <laughs> with your true. patronizing tone I mean, the bottom line is 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 that yes, what you said is he's like this could all end at any moment, which he would have already known, you know, because of his brother. It made him one hundred percent go pursue stuff that meant something to him, and and I think that car crash is is enormous because that's when people who meet him after that say this guy didn't sleep, his work was everything. Clearly a workaholic, clearly driven by something greater than what most. You know, a lot of people, fame, celebrity, this kind of stuff. He was driven by something much, much greater and much deeper to do the work that he did. So that, that car accident is important to talk about when you talk about Gary Shandling. And you'll see in the documentary, he writes a lot. He has a journal. He has these diaries. That's what the documentary is kind of based on. But he just, his notes, Have you? he saw his notes for these jokes. Like, it just these pages and pages of line paper, which just scribbles everywhere. They seem like they're written in some sort of code. Like, how would you ever get the joke out of these? And there's things written in the margins and things like this. But this is just a glimpse to his mind. Yeah. It's that... It's always sunny in Philadelphia, Charlie Day meme. You know that meme where like behind him is like this board of like all these crazy ideas and he's just trying to talk about like something very simple, but it's an insane right, right. bunch of the, it, it. That's what Gary Shandling's comedy notes look like at certain times. And so then he started doing stand up regularly. So why don't you tell me a bit about, because I think there's several things to talk about, but let's start with Gary Shandling's comedy. He started doing comedy, now we're in the late 70s, and that's all he's doing, no more writing. What is it about Gary Shandling's comedy that you think is so legendary? I think, you know, in The New Yorker, it was said that he was the patron saint of the lonely and the alienated. And I didn't realize it at the time, you know, that that wasn't what was connecting with me, because I do remember him from his sets on Carson. He was on Johnny Carson quite a bit, and I caught at least one or two of those sets as a young person. I remember even then being like, this guy's just very, very different. And it's very funny. And I remember that sort of whiny voice and mm -hmm. his style. It was just like, 
does this guy practice this or does this guy just come up and these are his ideas? You don't you only feel that about exactly. a, a small handful of comedians. Some of them, it looks rehearsed. It looks pre a practice. It's a theatrical thing, you know? So it's like, oh, like the theater, they do rehearsals. Like when I was in Tom Sawyer in the sixth grade, we had to do rehearsals. You rehearse. But some comedians would come up and you'd just be like, I think this guy's just, these are his actual experiences. I don't know. It was so, it felt very, very original. And what they said in The New Yorker was his, his comedy and, and, you know, his persona in, in life taught everyone that it was okay to hate yourself if you were hilarious about it. And he was by no means the first self-deprecating comedian, but he had just such an original style about it. And whether he was, even when he was talking about somebody else, it was always very funny. So it was mixed in with like a little narcissism and then a little self-deprecation. And I remember this joke. I, I remember this quite clearly. You know, I don't remember the joke well, but I remember he, he had this, this, this bit about, I took this woman to a barbecue and she was all into herself. She was all about her. Have you, you, you met somebody like this? You know, she was, it was all me, 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 you know, like, oh, I think my dress caught on fire uh, by the barbecue. <laughs> oh, I think I need water for my dress. Somebody help me, you know, me, 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 me. And I remember that bit and, and I butchered it as far as, you know, word, word for word. But that's like a memory. And I don't have a great memory for jokes, to be quite honest. Like people can rattle off street jokes like one by, I don't, bad memory for jokes, bad memory for card games, but that's one that stuck in mind. And I, I really thought it was, you know, and then I didn't see him for a while. And then I remember he would guest host on Johnny Carson. And then when his shows came out, I was like, that's that guy. Amazing. That's the guy. I remember this dude. Yeah, there was this discussion in the documentary about how his performance had to catch up with his jokes. Like, he was such a brilliant joke writer. This is from Dave Coulier from Full House. So he was a good friend of Gary Shandling's when they were in Up and Coming Comics, as was Bob Saget. They were all really good friends. And he said, yeah, his jokes are there. He just has to get this persona and find his voice and this performance, which he eventually did. It's also interesting. He had this very analytical point of view. There's one point where they show in his diaries, he's talking about how to handle a heckler. He's like, oh, you relate things back not to the heckler, like you repeat what the heckler said, but you're repeating to the audience. You're not talking to the heckler, you're talking to the audience. And then you try and tie in your other jokes that you have coming up in your sets with what the heckler said. Like it's such an analytical way of, you know, whereas most people would be like, oh, just make fun of that heckler and move on. Right. But he yeah. had to like piece it out. I just found it so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. His jokes were, and he worked, he had a frenetic energy. And so when he threw himself into stand-up, he really did. So he would have dealt with plenty of hecklers on the road as well. And every, every thought he had about comedy, about the joke, about the broader world of comedy, about his goals, about his deepest desires within comedy, were all there in these diaries. And I was explaining to somebody that the reason this is called the Zen Diaries of uh, th this particular special that Apatow did. The reason it's called this, The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling, is because everybody says that even when you knew him, you didn't really know him. You know, some of his closest friends were like, being his friend was like constantly, like, you felt like you were auditioning to be somebody who's not going to disappoint him. He was, he was defensive and he was a, you know, a little bit like, he kept things to himself. As you said, Asif, with the death of his brother, he barely talked about that at all. So he wasn't an easy guy to be around and yet so, so revered. And the diaries are this, you know, open, open window into his, his soul, his very, very, you know, every single thought he ever had. So that's why this, you know, you, you need to know a little bit about Gary Shanley. You need to have that context to understand why it's called the Zen diaries of Gary. And, and the Zen thing is something that we'll, we'll get to before we, we wrap up. That was a big part of his life as well. Yeah. And so before we move into some of the other aspects of his life, including his two major TV shows, you want to tell a story about how he crossed a picket line or something like that in the Well, 70s? so part of my class, I talk about this comedy strike that happened in the early 80s. And the, the strike was, you know, people say it's a little bit broader than just the comedy store. But in fact, it was about the comedy store in LA. Which is a legendary performance venue. Legendary place owned by Mitzi Shore. Some people, if you don't know Mitzi Shore, you might know her son, Polly Shore. 
Some I of you may not that. like Molly Shore. Are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know that that was. <laughs> okay. And so she was this comedy club owner of the comedy store. She was the owner. So in the divorce with her husband, she got the store, which I think at the time, the, the lore is her husband was like, you know, she won't be able to run this place for like three months. Fine. You want the store, take the store. And she wanted it and she got it in the divorce. And that's why we never even like her husband was, there were a few comics who would have dealt with him as well, but she really become this, the, came this, uh, I don't know if impresario is the right word. For a, well, I don't know if there's a female version of the word impresario, but it sounds good. Sounds good. All right, you you you're you're good with it. So she started and worked all these comics. Now you have to kind of remember the reason I talk about this in my stand up comedy class is because you know in this age of YouTube and Vimeo and web pages and all this kind of stuff, it's important to remember that there was this era of one thing: the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. That was it. Comedians from all over the world moved across, you know, well, all over the world, all over North America, let's say, particularly the U.S., moved to L.A. Why? Because they needed to get on late night. And it was also watched in such huge numbers. It was the thing. If you were on The Tonight Show, in fact, there are stories of people who got on The uh, Tonight Show, and then just hit it huge within days. Freddie Prinz, a lot of people might know Freddie Prinz Jr., but the original Freddie Prinz, stand-up comedian, you know, he went on Tonight Show. Johnny Carson fell in love with him immediately. He would have been very young, like really, really early 20s. And right away, NBC sitcom, Chico and the Man, nobody really, you know, but anyway, uh, his uh, life ended a, a little tragically, you know, he did take his own life in this whole thing. But but the fact is that he was on Carson. They saw him. Carson gave him the thumbs up, loved him, called him over to the chair, went to commercial. Commercial's done. Come back. He's still sitting in the chair. I mean, he fell in love with this dude. So he was like the gold standard. All these comedians, like, if I'm on Carson, I could do this, and then I'll get a sitcom. This was everybody's world. So the comedy store was seen as this gateway. You get discovered because the booker from the comedy store, from, from Tonight Show, will come to the comedy store. They'll see you. They'll book you. Book. So everybody was doing, I need my five. I need my tight five so that my, my TV five, you know? It came to a head. The, the, this whole strike happened because Mitzi wasn't paying anybody, which is inconceivable now, of course. You, you'd you be like, what? Why? How, how could that work? But Mitzi... She had different rooms in the comedy store. And in, in this particular room where all these L.A. comics work, she was like, no, this is an incubator. This is a gym. This is where you work out. I don't need to pay you. I let you train here for free and you do whatever you want to do. And then you go out on the road and make money. OK, but then there was comics from Vegas coming in and making hundreds of dollars for their shows. And, you know, the Don Rickles of the world, for example, come in and do and now these other comedians are like, wait a second, Mitzi has me opening for Don Rickles. I heard Don Rickles making whatever it was. I don't know the numbers. Let's say 500 bucks a show. And I'm still making zero because I'm a comedy store comedian. And they weren't asking for much. They were asking for enough money to like get a meal yeah. or pay for their cab over. It wasn't unfair demands that they have if you, you read about the strike. But it was a pretty serious, serious thing for comics. Some of the greatest, the most established co comedians you know, like Jay Leno, like David Letterman, like, you know, Richard Belzer, all these guys from the, that era who've gone on to do you know, huge things, they were on the picket line. Gary Shandling crossed the picket line. And I, and I think that that's very, very interesting because, you know, some people, I don't know, you, when you cross a picket line and you're a scab, you really, you know, you're disregarded and disrespected forever. Something about Gary Shandling allowed him to be, you know, sort of welcome back in, into comedy. Although, you know, what he would say was that he was never in comedy to begin with. But yeah, you know, just to give you an idea how serious that strike was, there was a comedian, uh, Steve Lubetkin, who already they say he, mentally he was, you know, a little bit unhinged, but most comedians were and they didn't expect this. He jumped to his death from the 14th store, 14th story of a, of a hotel. And I think his his suicide note said, my name is Stu, Steve Lubetkin. I worked at the comedy store. 
that's the entire note. That's the entire suicide note, right? So this was this this thing was like it had a very very awful legacy for for many people. In any case, Gary Shandlin crossed that line. It's this weird blemish on his 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 career. It's a weird thing, but I think what it suggests is a note from his diaries that Judd Apatow shows where he says, Gary Shandling writes, the comedy store is like high school. I have to get past high school, right? So this is why I say to you that he had goals and dreams that were bigger than any about this. He didn't want to be in this fraternity. For some comics, this was the be all end all. I'm at the store, going to the store tonight, the store. This guy was like the store. I want to be on the Tonight Show. Then I want to host the Tonight Show, right? Now, some of those people, as I mentioned, who were in that high school clique of the comedy store, went on to do phenomenal things with their lives. But yeah, Gary, this was just a stepping stone. So I think that's the way he looked at it. Probably his car accident, probably his brother's death. He's like, listen, I, you know, I don't care about any of these petty squabbles that you guys have. I have bigger things in life to worry about. I have worried about bigger things. I've had larger concerns. This is not my be all end all. I'm going in. I just want to work. I just want to do comedy. I'm crossing the picket line. So, in fact, he did make it on The Tonight Show, and then it, he had this kind of existential crisis after that. He's like, I achieved my goal. What is the next goal? Bob Saget tells a beautiful story about him just sort of collapsing into his arms and crying and saying, now what? Now what do I do? This is all I wanted. What do I do now? It's beautiful. And so he ended up getting this development deal for a TV show, which became his first TV show, The Gary Shandling Show. And this show was so innovative for its time. A lot of people say, including all the writers on the show, went on to do The Simpsons. And they're like, this is the DNA of The Simpsons. Mm. This kind of irreverent sort of humor. It started on The Gary Shandling Show. So talk to us a bit about this show, Ali. The Gary Shandling Show is well known for both the shows he did, like, listen, it, it feels like you're, you're throwing around the word groundbreaking when you say somebody had two groundbreaking shows. But the Gary Shandling show, I can't recall where he had this epiphany, but he's like, must break down all walls. You know what I mean? When I say all walls, I mean, if you look up the Gary Shandling show, you know, the fourth wall is this idea that you know, there's this wall between us, the viewer, and the performer, and the performer pretends that we can't see them, they can't see us, and that is a wall. This is an invisible wall. He broke it down in the sense that he would continuously talk to the audience. This was like completely normal or like logical, I should say, for him, because he talks to an audience via stand-up comedy all the time. Why shouldn't his show also... So, for example, he would be at a scene at a dinner table in the sitcom and somebody would say something and he would say, can you excuse me for the minute? And then he'd walk right up to the camera and be like, can you believe she said that? Now what do I do? Do I ask her to leave? I don't know what I'm saying. Right? So we had this weird thing with him. But even right from the second the show starts, I don't know if you remember the theme song yeah, at all. Yeah, 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 so it's like, this is the Gary Shandling show. This is the Gary Shandling show. This is the part. Why are the credits roll? Like, it's just completely, like, exposing everything. Like, uh, you know, we're all in on the joke together. It was a, a very interesting thing. And I remember being a little uncomfortable with it, to be honest. You know, I'm here watching Family Ties, Facts of Life, Growing Pains. There's always a fourth wall, and he's breaking it down. And I was like, this is a bit too wild for me, you know? But there is no doubt about this pioneering, groundbreaking quality of that show, because then every time the fourth wall is broken, it's like it's like an ode or a nod, or it, whether people know it or not, it's rooted in what Gary did for, I think, three or four seasons he had that show. Yeah, I agree. And, and we're going to get into this theme, at least for me personally. I was a bit intimidated by his shows. And so this was the first one I was kind of, it just seemed too smart for me. It was like, hmm. however, I was 11 years old, 12 years old, I don't you know, quite get what's going on. This seems too avant-garde for me. And then now you look back on it you know, now with, with this lens of being older, you're like, oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. So he, during that time then, I guess, 
got a lot of guest hosting gigs on The Tonight Show. It was him, basically, and Jay Leno who were going back and forth. Yeah, it wasn't just a lot of gigs. It was, they were the two. The permanent they guest were host. The permanent guest host, yeah. yeah. As, as Johnny was phasing out, as Johnny Carson was phasing out from, from his hosting. And in fact, they offered him to continue on as his permanent guest host. They hadn't got to the point where Johnny was completely retiring and choosing a successor. And he, even though that was his dream, as you said, to host The Tonight Show, he kind of stepped away from being this permanent guest host because he was so concentrated on his TV show. For all his workaholism, he had met his match. He couldn't host The Tonight Show and then write, create, and, you know, star as the lead and learn his lines and all that kind of stuff of his own show at the same time. He just didn't have the bandwidth for it. So he sort of stepped away from that. But at that time, so he's been a guest as a comedian on The Tonight Show. He then hosts The Tonight Show for an extended period of time, not just as a guest one-off, as a for extended period of time, and then creates a show that is a... Mockery? Mockery is not. Maybe spoof? The right spoof of The Tonight Show or shows like it, late night television shows. So again, incredibly unique career path, doing what he wanted to do. And again, absolutely a groundbreaking show. There was nothing like it. The influence of The Larry Sanders Show cannot be understated. It was the first time we saw celebrities playing unpalatable versions of themselves, right? That's huge for Hollywood. Hollywood, it was always, you show, you put your best foot forward. And this is this brilliant satirical talk show. If you have not seen the Larry Sanders show, I recommend it unconditionally. I own the box set. So on the box set, you also have commentary from people like Jeremy Piven. You know, when I got the box set, I rewatched all the episodes and Jeremy Piven at that point was living his best life, Ari on Entourage. And just to hear him talk about going in every single day and learning from, in particular, these three people, Gary Shanling, Jeffrey Tambor, Rip Torn. And he said they were like playing comedy like it was a Greek tragedy. That's the way they delivered their lines and the energy of their deliveries. And he goes, it was this incredible comedy clinic that I would get to go into and see every single day. And when you watch it from that lens, you know, playing comedy like Greek tragedy, I, I just love it. I just, uh, I, I love that description. And I love the people that go on to have great careers. That was their clinic. That was their, 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 their training, better training than they would have gotten anywhere. Gary Shandling himself, as Larry Shanders, plays this like self-obsessed, full of self-doubt, guy. I loved watching, you know, half the time I was like, is this like what Gary Shanley is really like? It just seemed so real. The, the, again, the, the line was so like, what do we, like when he would be at home, he would have somebody guest host, right? So he'd be at home. Larry Sanders would be like, I'm taking a few nights off. Rip Torn, Artie would say, You're, you got to take a few nights off. He'd be at home. He'd watch his own show. He'd have a woman, his girlfriend there, caressing his stomach, his chest. Not interested. Interested in the show. Do you think they like John Stewart more than I do? Do you think they like John? Oh, God, John's really hamming it up. Do you think he's hamming it up too much? Like he would be obsessed with his own show and his guest host, who he handpicked. He would go there next day, and everyone would be like, "Gary, you're not supposed to be at work today," or "Larry, you're not supposed to be at work today." Yeah, I just want to make sure everything's all right. I mean that level of obsession and workaholism you had to wonder like is this what he is he writing from a place of knowledge and personal experience and i think that made the show so phenomenal as well but one of the greatest satirical shows of all time uh, al jean is a television writer said that the start of this show marked the dawn of what is called the golden age of television I would agree with Al Jean as a writer on uh, The Simpsons, and I agree with you. And I know this because I watched the first episode. So I never watched the show before. Again, I found it intimidating. Plus, it came on right when I was in university and medical school. So I didn't really have HBO and things like that. And again, it seemed too intelligent for me, so I didn't really watch it. And I watched the first episode just this week in preparation for the podcast. I'm like, this is – it holds up today. It's crazy. It. All the jokes and the way it's filmed, and they talk about this in the documentary, like someone's asking Gary Shandling, like, do you get royalties from a TV show like Extras, Modern Family, The Office, 
filmed in this verite style with a handheld camera. Right. And they did it way before because the sections of the show where it's actually the Larry Sanders show and he has a guest on is filmed on videotape like a typical talk show. And the behind the scenes stuff is filmed on on film. So you have this kind of difference uh, between the way they're, they're filmed. It, it, it just so groundbreaking. And as you said, like a lot of creators can have one show, right? Jerry Seinfeld had Seinfeld. They did a classic show. But then to repeat that again and have two Stone Cold Classics, as we say. Stone Cold Classics, as one of us says. It's unbelievable. Little trivia for you here, Asif. Little trivia. In 1993, Gary Shandling was offered a late night talk show on NBC, but he chose instead to keep doing the Larry Sanders show. That late night talk show became what? The late show with Conan O'Brien. You got it, buddy. Conan O'Brien probably knows it's someplace in his heart that, man, now, Conan is one of my favorite human beings, one of the best, but he was rickety out of the gates by his mm -hmm. own admission, and he knows that somebody, a seasoned veteran like Gary Shandling, had he said yes to that, there would be no Conan. I O'Brien. think he has been pretty clear about that. Like It was Gary Shandling's to take or not take, and, right. and he got it much later in the process. Yeah. The interesting thing happens then afterwards because the Larry Sanders show ends. I think you can read the documentary, read some some books about it. There were some kind of tensions and, and kind of burning out towards the end. But then the problem with Gary Shandling, he's such a creative person, but also neurotic, but also a writer. What hmm. does he do next? And it's very interesting what happens next. There were a couple things that he did. He did this movie, What Planet Are You From?, which I, I just remembered when I was watching this documentary. I remember it came out, I never watched it, where he plays an alien who has to like get together with a human to continue their race. And <laughs> it's all kind of with the neuroticism of Gary Shandling. Yeah. But it was directed, I know this, by Mike Nichols. Mike Nichols, you know, one of the greatest directors of all time. And apparently Mike Nichols is a super nice, friendly, calm, excellent director. All the actors love him. But Mike Nichols essentially was irate and annoyed by Gary Shandling every day on this film shoot because Gary was – he second-guessed himself as an actor. Again, he could do the Gary Shandling show. He could do Larry Sanders, but this was him playing an alien and doing this. And apparently Mike Nichols found it so frustrating and he hated it. Well, one of Gary Shandling's writers in the documentary says – Working with him on the Larry Sanders show was like, or I think, no, it was on the Gary Shandling show, was a fun 80-hour week every week <laughs> because of exactly what you're saying. The second guessing, the search for better, we can do better, now there's a better joke, I think we could do. And so this constant striving for the best, best thing, never settling, those are the people who need to have their own show. Those right. are the people who probably should not be working with Mike Nichols. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that was a colossal failure. And then I think he was trying to search for what to do and he wasn't really sure. And this is where some interesting things happened. There was this cartoon over the hedge. I don't know if you remember this cartoon. I or don't. If your kids have seen it. I can't think my kids have seen it. There's like Avril Lavigne is in it. Bruce Willis is in what? it. It's about this. It's kind of like a great escape or maybe not a great escape, but like a heist film, but done with a cartoon. And he plays this turtle in it. And apparently he spent four years writing and rewriting the dialogue for this turtle. Apparently he's really good at it and he's it's it's funny, but and the writers were happy to get it because they were all like idolized him. So they were like yeah. happy to get his rewrites and stuff like that and and going over the jokes. And there's just like the amount of effort he put in to this one character in this cartoon was unbelievable. So now I want to watch the movie because I never never saw it. And then the other thing he did was these DVD extras that you talked about on the Larry Sanders. So they want to release the DVD box set. So he went back and filmed these DVD extras. But they're crazy extras. Like he'll go back and do like a 45-minute interview with one person and another. And he puts so much effort into this. It's almost like it's not quite the same runtime as the entire Larry Sanders. But it's a huge amount. You have the box set. so I have the box set and I remember thinking – as I fully appreciated what was in this box set, I remember thinking, okay, so I basically need like a March break and I need to leave my family and I need to go from a Saturday to a Sunday of the next week 
to get through this thing. I don't know how I'm ever going to, there was, it's so ripe with content. And also it's the type of show that sometimes you need to sit and be like, what did I just watch? You know, you don't want to necessarily jump to the next episode and the next episode. It is overflowing with content and that's not a bad thing, but you need a lot of time to get through it. So it's interesting. One of those extras, he interviews Jerry Seinfeld. They go for a walk, I think in Central Park. And Seinfeld said later on that meeting with Gary Shandling and them just chatting, old friends catching up, that was the inspiration for comedians and cars getting coffee. Because, and he's like, you helped that with this DVD extra. And that's why he did it. So, of course, recently, it was about a year or two before Gary Shandling passed away, he was on Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. And it's a very interesting dynamic because Jerry Seinfeld is a very cynical person, much more so than he is on his. TV show and even in his stand up. If you actually see interviews with him, he really doesn't have time for anything in this world. He's much yeah. more similar to Larry David than people think because of the way they were portrayed on TV. Similar to Asif Doja as well, I might add. There we go. Yep. So, Gary Shandling talks a lot about his turning to Zen, turning to Buddhism as he got older and trying to find this solace. He did meditation before meditation was even remotely cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's been yeah. into this for years. As oh, it was, wasn't for the coolness of it at all. It was to settle his own mind and, and focus and, and zero in on his thoughts. Yeah. So this is the quote from Sarah Silverman in this documentary. And it's such an interesting quote. She said, Gary Shandling was Zen because he needed to be Zen, not because he was Zen. In other words, he's not a Zen person who then puts that out in the world. He needed to be this way. And yeah. you can see that through a lot of these diaries and things like that. And very interesting. We're, we're going to link to this GQ article that talks about the various facets of Gary Shandling's life before he passed away in that decade before he passed away. So he was a Buddhist, practicing Buddhist. He meditated, as Asif just said. He also loved playing basketball. And then what else do Buddhists love, Asif? Boxing, apparently. He uh, boxed four times okay. per week. He co-owned a boxing gym in Santa Monica. He and, and Peter Berg, actor-director Peter Berg, oh, yeah. co-owned this boxing gym. So, you know, he is that sort of like walking contradiction in a way. He always has been. It's always strange to like learn more about Gary Shandling, but it's, I think it's really, really worth the journey. I think the documentary, although it, you know, it is said to sag a little in that last quarter, but I think, you know, it was something, all these diaries were left to Judd Apatow and he did the best thing he could with it. He got all these people who loved him and idolized him on board to talk about him. I also would recommend Gary Shandling talking to Mark Marin on WTF. That's a 2011 interview. I really enjoyed that. Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, Asif mentioned that episode. And then also Mark talking, you know, in memoriam about Gary Shandling after the fact and talking about the funeral. It was very moving because his, his death was so unexpected too for so many of them. And, you know, he did die in 2016. He died because he had this disease, hyperparathyroidism, which we'll talk about in a second. But he left a lot of money. He bestowed $15.2 million for medical research at the David Geffen School of Medicine in UCLA. And in case people don't know, that is the David Geffen from the music Is the music? Industry. Music yeah. Geffen? Yeah. yeah, okay. He donated in, in about 2000, 2001, $200 million unrestricted donation to the medical school at UCLA. That's why it's named the David Geffen School. He established, he being Gary Shandling now, established the Gary Shandling Endocrine Surgery Research Fund, the Gary Gary Shandling Infectious Disease Innovation Fund, and the Gary Shandling Pancreatic Disease Fund. And we'll get into why some of those were, of course, close to him. He also established the Gary Shandling Medical Research Fund. And he also created a learning studio called the Gary Shandling Learning Studio, a 6,400 square foot multipurpose space in the school's medical education building. So a legacy that he left to medicine, and of course, this amazing legacy he left to comedy. So, Asif, the news reports when Gary Shandling died were that he died of a heart attack. Yeah. A and B, 
widely reported he was not known to be in any particular poor health. Therein, thereby, therewith, I don't know what the preposition is, but again, proving the point that Gary Shandling kept things close to his chest. That's not a heart attack pun. I'm talking about he did not tell anybody about this condition he had been suffering with. So I, again, we started this episode by saying I thought I might know a little something about it because of the word thyroid in hyperparathyroidism. Apparently, I don't know a thing about it. And, you know, sometimes that makes for a better interview because I can ask you more intelligent questions here. But yeah, let's get into this. First and foremost, is this another herpes zoster situation? What does hyperparathyroidism have to do, if anything, with thyroid disease? Okay, so it doesn't, except the location. So these parathyroid glands are about the size of a pea, and you have about four of them, and they're located in the posterior part of the thyroid gland. So they're embedded into the thyroid gland. That's the way I kind of conceptualize it. Mm -hmm. And what they do is, so even though they're in the thyroid, they have nothing to do with thyroid hormone. They regulate calcium. So the amount of calcium in your body, it kind of acts as a set point. So it it will, if you need more calcium, it will help to mobilize more calcium to get you more. If you have too much, it will will help with that as well. Okay. So just to be clear, this P-side a gland exists in everybody, and Correct. it is a calcium regulator. Correct. Okay. Exactly. So if they're overactive, that's the hyper in hyperparathyroidism, then they would raise the amount of calcium in your body. And because of that, that can cause problems in many different areas. Because, well, we'll get into this. There's this mnemonic that we use in medicine to remember what hyperparathyroidism causes. And it's bones, stones, abdominal groans, and psychic moans, though I learned it as psychic overtones, but it rhymes. So bone, stones, Mm -hmm. abdominal groans, psychic moans, or overtones. So calcium in the bones, that would be obvious. Now, you're supposed to take calcium for your bones, but too much calcium is not good for your bones. In fact, what happens, so there are two main areas of our body that calcium is involved with and how we kind of get more calcium, and it's our bones and our kidneys. So the stones is actually kidney stones. Mm -hmm. So, But calcium affects every part of our body because... Calcium is involved in neurotransmission and the transmission of sort of electrical discharges in every cell in our body. So these are the main areas it's involved, but it can involve lots of other areas, which we'll get into. So bones, what happens is that you can get resorption of calcium and mobilization of calcium from your bones, and that can cause your bones to become brittle and what we call osteopenic. So not quite hollow, that's not the right thing, but brittle, thinner, and that's going to be one issue. So you could have fractures and things like that because of this hyperparathyroidism, because you're having excessive resorption of calcium from your bones. Then because calcium is excreted in the urine, you have lots of calcium coming out, that's going to predispose you to kidney stones. Ali, have you ever had a kidney stone before? Thankfully, no. Hopefully, that's not on the menu here. Me neither, but my friends who've had it, it is apparently extremely painful, and we learn that in medicine as well, and pain management is important for those patients. So again, that's when it comes to the kidneys. You can get these gastrointestinal manifestations as well. That's the abdominal groans? No, what was that one? Yeah, abdominal groans. So, But it's often very vague, just a decreased appetite, Maybe some abdominal pain that's very vague, maybe some nausea, constipation. Sometimes you get like ulcers because of that, but it becomes tough, right? Because you may not notice, obviously, that your bones are getting more osteopenic, right? How would you notice that? Maybe you notice a kidney stone, maybe that's a manifestation of it. But a lot of these symptoms can either be very mild or what we call nonspecific, or sometimes you can be completely asymptomatic and you just, your doctor is doing some routine blood work, finds your calcium is high, and then you get diagnosed with this. So it can go undiagnosed for years and years. And I think that's what they thought was going on with Gary Shandling. He probably had this for years and never really was able to put it together. Now, it can also cause pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas. And 
they allude to this actually in the documentary. I don't think he had acute pancreatitis, but he had what's called chronic pancreatitis, where you've had pancreatitis that goes on for a long period of time. You can develop cysts. And they don't really address it in the documentary other than to say this was a complication of his hyperparathyroidism and he needed surgery for it. And the surgery for chronic pancreatitis is usually because of pain. People have like extensive pain that goes on for a long period of time and sometimes they need surgery. And he went for surgery for his pancreas in the documentary. So I'm pretty sure that's what happened. So this pancreatic involvement is less common in patients with hyperparathyroidism, but it can occur. And then you have those psychic moans and overtones, right? And they can be very subtle. Sometimes it's muscle weakness or something that's a bit more concrete, but often it's fatigue, depression, poor concentration, memory problems, and often just a brain fog, right? And sometimes you just say, oh, that's just people getting older. Sometimes you misdiagnose people with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia because of the pain. And that can make these very difficult to diagnose because these are, as I said, nonspecific symptoms. So who knows how many of those things Gary Shandling had? Was that contributing some depression in him mm. and his need to find Zen? I don't know. I mean, that's all conjecture. And of course, I'm talking about what's called primary hyperparathyroidism, which is the most common type. We'll talk about the secondary and tertiary form in a little bit, but they're less relevant to our conversation about Gary Shanley. I like the way you say, of course, as though I should be, a, yes, 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 of course, Asif. You mean that for the medical community at large who listens to us? I've been listening pretty carefully. I don't think you talked about what causes yeah. this, why he would have gotten it over somebody else. Is this out of your control? Yeah, a lot of times you develop an adenoma, which is a benign tumor. Sometimes it could be a cancerous tumor, but usually that's very rare. Usually it's not in one of the parathyroid glands, and that will cause excess cell proliferation and excess parathyroid hormone secretion, which results in your calcium abnormalities. But it can be genetic. There are some pretty rare disorders. I don't really see these, but my colleagues at endocrinology do called multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, where you can have multiple different types of tumors from a lot of different endocrine glands. There's another disorder called hyperparathyroid jaw tumor syndrome, and another familial syndrome called familial isolated hyperparathyroidism. Those are extremely rare. Again, the general physician doesn't often see a lot of these things, but it can be genetic in rare cases, but often it's because you develop this tumor and there may not be a genetic reason why you develop that. And what about like, how common is it? it it's advertised is maybe the wrong word, but it's said that it's fairly rare, right? You don't hear about this too yeah, often. Yeah, it is, it is fairly rare, but we're finding more and more, especially in developed countries, you know, you're not feeling that well, you're family doctor perhaps will just do a panel of blood work just to see your your hemoglobin, your thyroid, right? You asked about thyroid before. And then yeah. sometimes just include a calcium, and then you'll find this calcium happens to be high. And then if you go down that pathway, you measure the calcium, you measure the parathyroid hormone levels, then you can see that it's high. And usually that's enough to diagnose someone with that. But then the question is, of course, if you have symptoms versus you don't have symptoms, so you have to kind of go through all the things we talked about, the bone stones, abdominal groans, psychic overtones, and then decide whether you're symptomatic or not from that. And whether you're symptomatic, and even in some patients who have no symptoms, and they just have to have this high calcium, it is probably worth looking into treatment for this because prolonged hyperparathyroidism can, as we said, cause all those side effects we talked about, including especially the brittle bones and things like that. So you, you probably do want to at least monitor it if you're not going to treat it. But if you have symptoms, and even if you're asymptomatic and don't have any contraindications, any reason to not pursue treatment, you should probably look into it. Is this what led to Gary Shandling's heart attack? I didn't hear anything about that. That's a good question. You can have some heart problems with it, not as common as some of the other associated problems that we see. So I don't know about that, what okay. the relation for that. Or maybe he had a surgery and then, you know, obviously with an anesthetic and surgery, you can have heart complications after that. I really don't know. And that hasn't really come out. I would like to believe, which is a weird way of phrasing it, but I would like to believe that his heart attack was related to this condition because otherwise you've got a guy who's meditating, 
who's eating well and boxing four days a week, getting a heart attack. And that turns a lot of our common yeah. knowledge about health on its head. Yeah, we don't know. What is the treatment? You were saying you should be seeking treatment. What is it? Right. There are some medical treatments, but really the curative treatment is surgery. So you surgically excise these parathyroid glands. The, the gland gets completely removed? So like I said, there's four of them. And so what they often do is they can use some imaging techniques to find out which one may be the gland, which it has a tumorous component, which is secreting the increased levels of parathyroid hormone. That's not always exact, the imaging from my reading of it. So often what they do is they go, they you know, start doing the surgery and they may do intraoperative parathyroid hormone levels. So basically you excise one gland that you think is suspicious and then you check the level. If the level goes down after five to 15 minutes after the resection, then you're like, okay, that was the one causing the problem. No, you don't need to do any further. If not, then you continue with further excising more glands until you see the hormone level go down. If you have an expert who does this, and obviously you want some expertise, this is a pea-sized gland, you want to make sure people know what they're doing, 97 to 98% cure rate. Okay. And, you know, repeat surgery is sometimes needed in patients if you had maybe an incomplete resection or that you develop high calcium levels afterwards. But in a lot of patients, it can be curative. Like I said, there's also medications and things like that. But I think for the purposes of our discussion, you know, we should say surgery by an experienced surgeon is the way to go. For most people, like I said, definitely if you have symptoms and there's even an argument if you have no symptoms, you should think about it. I love the with an experienced surgeon part, not Rocco in his garage, not your neighbor. He's made wine. He's got some tools. Dr. That Nick guy. from The Simpsons. There Dr. you go. Nick Another exactly. Simpsons reference. And before we wrap this up, you wanted to mention secondary, tertiary, hyperparathyroid. Yeah, this is just hyper because of my type A-ness. I want to be complete with these other types of hyperparathyroidism. So the two other ones- We'll again, allow it. Yeah, I think the primary one was, was the one that Gary Shandling had, because these other ones are associated with people who have kidney disease. So basically, we mentioned how important the kids are in maintaining the calcium balance. And so the secondary one is a result either because of chronic kidney disease or vitamin D deficiency, which causes rickets. And you think, oh, well, that's pretty uncommon, but it actually is pretty common, especially in darker skinned individuals, especially darker skinned individuals who move to northern climates, like people from Africa, India, South Asia, moving to North America or Northern Europe. So it can definitely happen. We've seen cases of rickets. I've seen cases of rickets before at the hospital. But the kidneys are responsible for calcium imbalance. So either a kidney problem or a vitamin D deficiency, you can get the hyperparathyroid levels increasing, but that's because they're trying to compensate for this other problem, either low vitamin D or kidney problems. And then for those patients, the treatment is medical, though if the medical treatment doesn't work, you could do the surgery that we talked about before. And the tertiary one is interesting. It occurs also in kidney disease. But what happens is you have the secondary hyperparathyroidism for a while, right? Because you have chronic kidney disease, then you get like a kidney transplant. So then, okay, everything should normalize. Your calcium should be fine. But for whatever reason, the parathyroid gland keeps on producing high levels of hormone for unknown reasons. And so in those patients, you often need to treat them. And again, those patients often have surgery required for them. So again, those are the two not really relevant for a discussion, but I want to say it as part of completeness. Good for you, buddy. I know that would bother you for the rest of your week if you didn't shut the box completely. Obsessive, just like. Obsessive, just like a doctor should be. No, just like Gary Shandling. Gary Shandling, I know. That is our talk about both Gary Shandling and hyperparathyroidism. If you have not seen, or if it's been a while since you've seen The Larry Sanders Show, I encourage it thoroughly and unabashedly. I, I hope you'll take a look at this show. I mean, as we say, a groundbreaking doesn't even come to close to covering it. It's an, and it's an opportunity to see probably some of your favorite actors and various celebs being despicable <laughs> lunatic versions of themselves 
and yeah, it really remains a great show. Any thoughts you have on this this show, this episode, please do share it with us. I'll mention this. In the month of August, if you live in Toronto, I'm hosting at the CNE for Howie Mandel. That should be a fun show. And it's oh, wow. free. It's free. Yeah. If you are in Western Canada and getting out to the Okanagan Valley, I'm hosting a few shows as part of the Okanagan Comedy Festival. A great time to be there when in is late that, August. Ollie? That is in late August, 25th, okay. 26th, right around there. Okay, great. And then my book, Is There Bacon in Heaven, is available for pre-order. You might be like, what is Ali Hassan doing? Why is he telling us all about this? I've been chastised a number of times, both by Asif and Marco Timpano, who I co-host another podcast with. This podcast is delicious. And they said, promote stuff. You idiot. So I'm doing it. There it is. There's some good stuff out there. And you know what? I stand behind all of it. So I don't know why I feel bad about promoting because you're guaranteed great shows and with all those things. And the, the book is something I'm really proud of. So reach out to us, Dr. V Comedian at gmail.com, Dr. V Comedian on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. As I always say, we are everywhere. And remember that although I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor. Medical issues we talk about are for your interest and information only, and they're not medical advice. Please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice. Thanks for listening. Bye, honey.